am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. It is Edward Stilwell who walks alone. He is a kindly, unimportant little man, the type you pass on the street without noticing. Tonight, however, something will happen to him that changes everything. Something to make his life important and exciting and dangerous. Mr. Stilwell? Yes, ma'am. I have an appointment to see Mr. Gale. Yes, I know. Mr. Stilwell's here. Send him in. Go right in. Thank you. Mr. Stilwell? Yes, sir. Come in, sir. Come in. I want to thank you for staying in so late to see me. Mm -hmm. Don't mention. Sit down. Thank you. Well, what can I do for you? I want to know how much it would cost to have a young lady traced. <laughs> well, that I can't say offhand. When she disappeared, who is she? Her name is Laura Lund. It's seven years now since I saw her. That was when her mother died. Laura was 14 then. Seven years is a long time. Might cost a lot of money to find her. Are you a professional or businessman, Mrs. Stilwell? I have a store at 2319 McCall Street. Mm -hmm. A music store. Phonographs, new and secondhand. Radio. Uh, where do you live? I beg your pardon. I say, where do you live? Uh, 2319 McCall Street. Same address as the store? Yes, I have an apartment in the back. Mm -hmm. Laura and her mother live somewhere in the neighborhood, too. I know that because I'd see Laura playing along the block and see her mother coming home from work. The husband had been dead a good many years. He was a violinist. You can't even give me an address to start from? Just the neighborhood. Uh-huh. What is a girl like at 14? Oh, she was just a little girl. I would see lots of them playing along the block, and Laura Lund was no different than the others, except she was thin and had long blonde curls and big blue eyes. Was she tall or short, 14, or just average? She was going to be tall, I think. What happened to her after her mother died? Relatives take her? Was she put into an institution or what? I don't know. Well, if she's alive, she can be found. But it'll take money. I got a hundred dollars. A hundred dollars. <laughs> Can't you dig deeper? Isn't there any way you can raise money? Maybe you're not very interested in locating her. I can mortgage my business for a few hundred. Uh, I wouldn't do that to you. Why, a hundred bucks a go like that, we'd be no nearer to her. Would it make any difference if I tell you, if you find a Laura Lund, she will pay you any sum. Thousands. Yes, tens of thousands for bringing us together. What makes you think so? Nothing I am at liberty to discuss. Let me tell you one thing. The success of this office depends upon the mutual trust between my clients and myself. Oh, I'm sorry. I may not be the greatest detective in the world, but I am the most unusual. Now, if you want to put your confidence in me, I'll find a Laura. All I can tell you is this. If you find a Laura Lund, it's possible she will make you a wealthy man. Well, suppose I see what I can do with this. In the meantime, have you tried to locate her? Oh, yes. I put an ad in the newspapers, in the personal column. Uh -huh. If anyone tries to answer that ad, I want you to get in touch with me night or day, will you? Oh, yes, sure. And I'll let you know when I have anything to report. Thank you. And good
Good evening. You want me to save this? Yes, certainly. Open a file for Mr. Stillwell. Are you really going to look for that girl? Of course I am. And tomorrow I'm going to find her. Three days have passed, and Stillwell has had no word from the private detective he engaged. He has almost given up hope that he will ever find Elora Lund. But tonight, his long search is coming to an end. For you? Oh, it's a miracle that I ever knew you were looking for me. I'd been away, but a girl I went to school with sent me a clipping. Alora? Alora Lund. My, how you have grown. But you're just like I pictured you. And you're just like I remembered you. <laughs> you haven't changed a bit. <laughs> Oh, seven years don't make much difference at my age. Oh, but come, Laura, here. Sit down. Dear. Now, come, tell me. What have you been doing? And why didn't you come to see me? I was afraid they'd put me in an orphanage. So I took what little money there was in the house and ran away. I suppose you are wondering why I advertised for you. Well, of course I am. But even if you only wanted to talk to me, I'm glad you did. I guess I was too young to appreciate everything, but... I'll never forget what a friend you were to Mother and me. Do you remember those odds and ends your mother used to bring to me to sell for her? I brought some myself when she was ill. Well, I never sold them. I thought perhaps if your mother got well, she would like to buy them back. They were heirlooms, things she brought from Sweden. Would you like me to buy them back now? Is that why you wanted to find me? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> My dear, I wanted to tell you, you are a rich young woman. Among those odds and ends, I found a treasure that's worth a fortune. What is it? All in good time, my Laura. All in good time. <laughs> but I must go out for a minute or two. But you can wait right here. I engaged a detective to try and find you, my dear. When I told him I'd let him know the minute you answered my advertisement. I'll be back in a minute or two.
Mr. Gale? Yeah, this is Mr. Stilwell. Oh, hello, Mr. Stilwell. Oh, she is? And I'm sure she's a lot of London. Laura! Oh, Mr. Stilwell, I was frightened. I thought I heard somebody in the store. Oh, nobody would come at this hour. I got something to show you while we're waiting for Mr. Gale. See, it's a newspaper clipping. I thought of you the minute I read it. Oh, here it is. Read it, Laura, and you will understand why I said you're a rich young woman. What can I do for you? This store, Edward Stilwell, was murdered. Who discovered the body? I did. What, again? Now, this Stilwell's been running ads in the newspaper trying to locate a Miss Laura Lund. Yeah? Tonight he phoned me and said she was in the store. When I got here, he was dead and she had gone. No. Oh, yeah. Give us a break. Well, Give wait us a, a break. break. Now, wait a minute. The most significant feature of this whole thing is that this girl is not a Laura Lund. Well, who is she? She's an imposter. You can print that if you want to. Put it on the air. Where's the nearest phone? Right up the head of the stairs, first landing. Thanks, Thanks Mr. Scott. Gale. Thank right, you very much. Just a minute. Oh, Dr. Gale from Miss Hanson? Oh. You dirty rat. You've got your nerve to come here. Why, what have I done? You said it would be easy. There was no danger. You put me on a swell spot. I got you off that spot, too, didn't I? Oh, you did. How? Open the door, Frida. Let me in. Now, Frida. Look, Frida. I knew that someone was holding you because they thought you were a Laura Lund. I told the reporters that you weren't, and they broadcast it. Who killed the old man? I was tied up and gagged, and I thought it was going to get the knife like Stillwell. You were going to protect me, remember? How was I to know that he was going to be murdered? Did you kill him, Frida? Well, unless you've got a pretty good story, the police will believe that you killed him. You'll have to keep me clear of the police. You got me into this. Well, I know I did, my dear, but I wasn't present when he was murdered, and you were. I paid you a hundred bucks to try and find out why he was so anxious to locate Laura Lund. 
I still owe was alive for some time after you got there. What did he talk about? About the girl's mother. She sold him a lot of junk she'd brought from the old country. And among that junk, there was something very valuable. Mm-hmm. What was it? He wouldn't say. Oh, come on now, Frida. I coached you well for the part of Alora. He was absolutely convinced that you were on the level. Maybe, but he wouldn't tell me anything until you got there. What'd you do when he went out to phone me? Nothing. What'd you talk about when he came back? I was telling him I thought I'd heard somebody in the store. When all of a sudden, a door behind him opened and a guy walked into the room. Had you ever seen that guy before? No. Was he carrying anything? No. I'll answer it. Oh, good evening, Mr. Summers. I've had complaints about noise in this apartment. Mr. Gale, this is Mr. Summers, the manager. You'll have to leave immediately. We can't have loud talking at this time of night. People have to sleep. I can explain, Mr. Summers. I'm sorry. You'll have to leave. Good night. You'd better go, Don. Now, just a minute, just a minute. Are you sure that tough guy didn't take anything with him? Yes, he took me. And it was Laura Lund that he wanted. He let you go when the broadcast announced that the girl in the store was a phony. Where did he take you? I don't know. I was blindfolded. When he stopped the car, he untied me and walked me into a building. Anybody else there? I didn't hear anybody, but I heard a radio. Sometime in the night, I heard a news broadcast. Get yourself fixed up. We're going places. Where are we going? I'll find this tough guy and toss him to the police. And we're just going to drive round and round until we run into him. No, you're going to show me where he took you. All right. Go down and wait for me in your car. thing I ever heard of, even coming from you. I haven't the faintest idea where he took me. I know your eyes were covered, but you still had other senses. You could smell and hear and feel. Did you hear anything in that building besides the radio? I heard a railroad engine. Oh, that's something. Did you smell any industrial fumes around there? When we got out of the car, I smelled chocolate. Well, the Milton Candy Company's at the foot of Dow Street. What is the street like, smooth or bumpy? It's bumpy, like cobbles. Well, that could put us on Macy Street behind the Milton Candy Company. But what happened after that? We drove a little way along an unpaved road. Don, I'm frightened. Let's get out of here. When you got out of that car, did you step on cement or grass? Felt like gravel. Then I went out of, onto a board walk. And finally, three steps up into the house. Don, look. This must be the place. Let's get out of here. You go back and wait. Don't do it, Don. There's a killer in there. I don't see any car around. I don't think anybody's in there. I'm going to find out. You crazy fool. I go back and wait.
were they? Well, I think it's the police, but I didn't stop to look at their shields. Well, I guess Stillwell's murder is dead. Do you want to drive? Well, you're doing all right. So. What did they find it? Well, maybe we better go back and look for it. Just keep on going. Yeah? It's Taggart and Brown. I want to see you. Oh, come on up. Forgive us for keeping you up. Well, it's all right. How are you getting on with the Stillwell case? We got his murderer. It was Harry Pontus. He was killed resisting arrest. Well, that's fast work. Did you understand? I said the murderer was Harry Pontus. Well, am I supposed to know him? Every dick in the country knows him. He's pulled murders, stick-ups, and burglaries. A very mean man with a knife. He grew up here, but he never pulled any jobs in town. Well, he probably didn't want to embarrass his folks. We found a trick knife in his bedroom. He hadn't even bothered to wash the blood off. The medical examiner says it just fits the wound and still moves back. Lots of fingerprints on it, too. Well, you fellas can write the finish to that one. Yeah, but it'd look better in the record if we had a motive. Maybe we get a motive from the woman in Stillwell's store, or from the fellow that jumped out of Pontus' window. Yeah, there's a funny thing about that. I saw him when he was going over the fence. He looked just like you. Same size, same build. Even his feet looked about the same size as yours. How'd you happen to suspect Pontus? We got a phone tip. Any idea who gave it to us? A woman. A woman with a cultured voice who refused to reveal her identity. Yes, yeah, it usually is. But this time it was a man. You don't have any ideas about that guy who went through the window, do you? Certainly not. Don't bother to hide that. Here's a mate to it. Thanks. Uh, thanks for bringing it back. Uh, all right. I got the same tip you did. And I thought I'd follow it through before bothering you. I found that trick knife in Pontus's pocket. Before I could do anything about it, you fellas started hammering on the doors. What else did you find in his pockets? Only the stuff you found there. What did you do with the diamonds that Pontus took out of the music box? Diamonds? Yes, diamonds, emeralds, whatever it was Pontus found in the music box. I don't know anything about a music box. Your private information, there was one in Pontus's bedroom closet. He'd taken it apart, apparently looking for something that was hidden there. How big was it? Oh, about six inches in height, seven or eight inches in diameter. Not big enough to hold much cash, but a lot of uncut stones could have been hidden in it. I doubt it. You mean Pontus made a mistake? Something like that. Case doesn't wash up that easy. You trip over loose ends wherever you turn. For instance, who was the girl in Stillwell's store? Where is she? <laughs> that is confusing, isn't it? Well, you were quick enough to tell the reporters it wasn't the real Laura Lund. How'd you know that? I told you. I talked to Stillwell over the phone about her. Who was Laura Lund and why did Stillwell want her? <laughs> if I only knew the answer to that one. We're gonna know it before we leave here. Are you implying that I know more than I'm telling you? We're also implying you're going over for housebreaking. Oh, you can't be serious. You think not? Maybe you didn't, maybe you didn't know about the music box. But you broke into Pontus's house. That's enough to send you over. Now, who is Laura Lunn? <laughs> who is Laura Lunn? Now, Taggart, take it easy. Even a murderer's got his rights. Remember, we knocked before we came in here. I've told you all I know. If you insist on making yourselves ridiculous by accusing me of housebreaking, then I'm your prisoner. Then name the woman who was with Stillwell, and we'll forget the housebreaking for the time being. <laughs> Hello. Yes, this is Don Gale. Well, come right over here. It's important. Hello. Hello! Who is she? Well, you took the call. Who is that woman? I you, don't know. You've been teetering on the edge of the law for years. Get dressed.
Unaware of the search that is being made for her, the real Elora Lund is recovering from the effects of an accident in the quiet of a sanitarium. Elora? Elora? Oh, yes. Do you know a man named Stillwell? Well, yes, I knew him when I was a child. What about him? He was murdered last night, and somebody using your name was in his store at the time. Nurse! Nurse! She came to us a month ago to recuperate from injuries incurred in an auto accident. Is she able to walk? Yes, she plans to leave in a day or two. Then she was physically able to have gone into town last night. But she didn't. I saw her in the dining room between 7 and 8. Later, we ran a movie in the auditorium. She was there until 10 o'clock. Oh, hello, Miss Lund. Hello. Come in. Uh, this is Detective Taggart and Detective Burns. How do you do? Uh, sit down, Miss Lund. Why was Stillwell advertising for you? Well, I don't know. I must have had some reason. We want you to get in touch with him. Do you think he wanted to make you his heir? As I remember him, he was just a kindly old man. He wasn't the type to accumulate a lot of money. Do you think the young woman who impersonated you last night could have been one of those children you used to play with? No, he would have recognized her. Perhaps some adventurers came across the ad and thought she saw an opportunity. No, uh, that kind of a person wouldn't have fooled Stillwell for a moment. She'd have had to resemble Miss Lund and answer the questions that Stillwell would naturally ask. That imposter is the key to the whole case. It must be someone who knows a lot about you. I don't know who it could be. I'd only be too glad to help if I could. If you really want to cooperate with us, Miss Lund, you can. You probably read in the newspapers that we're holding the private detective that's Stillwell engaged. Yes, I did. Well, we think he sent that imposter to Stillwell. Stillwell would have described you to Gale as well as he could. He'd also have given him a lot of information about you. We haven't got any proof that Gale sent the girl to Stillwell. We don't want to be unfair to him. He may be absolutely honest. That's what you can find out for us, if you will. But I don't know what I can do. We'd like you to come back to town with us and see Gale. Well, is it all right for me to leave, Dr. Connell? Well, yes, if you wish. Good. We'll have Gail released. Then we want you to call at his office. Take some identification and tell him you want to know why Stillwell was advertising for you. I'll be ready in a minute. Well, now you know what the inside of a jail looks like. We're going to be nice to you. We're going to let you play around in the free, fresh air. But only for a few hours. Then we're going to bring you back in and put the formal charge against you. Unless you bring in the girl. What girl? The one you sent up to Stillwell. If I'd sent one up, wouldn't I be a sucker to tell you? Maybe that's where you made your slip. So long, Gail. We'll be seeing you. I thought you were... In jail? I was, but they let me out to get you. You're kidding, Don. You didn't tell them about me. Then why not? You tried to murder me last night. You're crazy. I warned you not to go in that house. I told you he was dangerous. You did everything but tell me he was Pontus. And then to make doubly sure that I'd be burned down, you phoned the police. I waited for you outside in the car. I was there when you ran out, wasn't I? And I drove you away. You didn't wait outside Pontus's house. You drove four-tenths of a mile to a phone and four-tenths of a mile back. Don, you I better... looked at the speedometer. Poor Frida, you never thought you'd have to face me after pulling that one. Did the police say a woman phoned? No, it was a man. Your boyfriend. You phoned him and he phoned the police. You're right, Don. But I only did it to help you. I knew he was a killer. You, you must believe me. I was scared you'd get killed in there. That's why I phoned. Oh, no, Frida. Your boyfriend phoned the police that Pontus was in there so they'd go in shooting and burn down anyone they saw. 
It is a neat little plot to get rid of me. You don't believe anything I say, so go ahead and tell the police about me. They won't do much to me, and it will cost you your license. It's not as simple as that. You and I have a lot to settle first. You're right. We have something to settle. You lied to me, pitched me into a murder. I'll talk. You're hurting me, Don. You thought there was money waiting for a Laura Lund, and you thought you could put yourself over as a Laura long enough to get that money. But you had to find some way to get me out of the picture. No. You're all wrong. You're only guessing. Why would I double-cross you? There'd be no point in having Stillwell killed unless you knew what it was all about. So we can start from there. And remember, you're talking for your life. All right. There is money in it. Two hundred thousand dollars. Think of it. A hundred thousand dollars each. Uh, so now we're partners. Why didn't you offer to cut me in last night? I figured I was entitled to anything I could get for what I went through last what night. What you went through. All right, I'm greedy. Pontos was working with me. But what about you? You're only sore because you wanted to grab it all for yourself. What was it Stillwell had that was worth two hundred thousand dollars and where is it? The police. They followed you here. Answer it. Frida. Frida. She's here. Frida? No, Alora Lund, the real one. I put her in your office because this place has been like a squad room at headquarters. Good girl. Now, if anyone comes in here even smelling of the police station, give me a couple of us. Don. Hey, what's the matter with you? You're afraid you're not working for a respectable firm just because I spent the night in jail? That's happened before. Well, then what is it? It's Laura Lund. She's a sweet kid and she's been sick and I'm not going to stand by and see her robbed. When have I ever robbed a client? Well, no, you've had an opportunity. Good afternoon, Miss Lund. I am Mr. Gale. Oh, please don't stand out. I suppose you read in the newspapers that Mr. Stillwell engaged me to try and locate you? Well, I've been in a sanitarium recovering from an accident. Oh, I'm so sorry. Well, now that you're here, it should be comparatively simple to get whatever it was Mr. Stillwell wanted you to have. I don't think I understand. Well, we go to the police and prove your identity, make a formal claim for your property. But I haven't any idea why Mr. Stillwell was advertising for me. You haven't? No. Was your family related in any way to Jenny Lind? No, not that I ever heard of. I want you to think very carefully before you answer this. Did your mother ever sell Mr. Stillwell any old wax records? Yes. What were they? Borvisa and Ensomaton. Jenny Lind sang them. What condition were they in the last time you saw them? Well, I don't know. I never saw them, but Mother told me about them. They were in a little square trunk with some old music boxes. Jenny Lind died in 1887. 
How did they come in your mother's possession? Jenny Lynn made them for my great-grandfather, but he never went into commercial production. Still, we wanted you to have them. He told me as much. And I feel confident that the wreckage is somewhere in that store. Well, then the police can find them. Well, while you and I know the records are rightfully yours, we can't prove it. And no matter how much the police might want to help you, they can't turn over to you anything that they can find in the store. The records do really belong to me, don't Why, they? Of course they do. When and I'm going to get them for you. And what's more, I'm going to turn Stillwell's murderer over to justice. Is what you're going to do legal? Well, turning a murderer over to justice is certainly legal. Won't it be dangerous? Well, not for you, it won't. Of course, I expect to be paid for any risks that I take. Uh, shall we say that I am to receive one-fourth of whatever the records bring? Really, Miss Lund, I... That's only fair. Fine. Where are you stopping? At the Garden Hotel. I don't want the police to see you until this is all over. I'm going to take you to the home of a woman I know. A very nice woman. And uh, you'll be out of sight there. Now, uh, uh, some of my clients like to leave this way, unnoticed. If you don't mind, I prefer to go out the way I came in. Boy, when we're playing for big stakes, we can't afford to be squeamish, can we? Look, if you have any confidence in me, maybe we better turn the whole thing over to the police. Well, it isn't exactly that. It's just that the confidence seems to be all on one side. For instance, you haven't yet told me about the girl you sent to Mr. Stillwell to impersonate me. Oh, that. Well, Stillwell wanted me to undertake the job of locating you without pay. I had to find out what it was all about, didn't I? I see. What was her name? Well, just a girl that works for me occasionally. I'll tell you all about it later. Come on. Denning, I'd like to have you meet Miss Lund. I'm always pleased to meet any friend of Don's. Miss Lund is a client of mine. She'd like to keep out of sight for the rest of the day. Come along. Just make yourself perfectly at home. No one will bother you here, dearie. Rose. I don't want her to use the phone, and I don't want her to leave. She expect me to use force if she tries to get away? <laughs> I expect you to use your head. Don. If I'm not back by 2 a.m., let her do whatever she wants to. Dearie, the phone's out of order. They're supposed to fix it today. It sounded all right when I dialed, and then it went dead. Sit down, dearie. Sit down. Take your weight off your feet. I don't know anything about telephones. I never was one for anything mechanical. I don't like the nasty things. They got on my nerves. Ringing all night. Uh, do you have any other lodgers? Not for the moment. 
it's easier and more profitable to have only occasional guests, like yourself. Then uh, the others only stay a couple of hours like I'm doing. Oh, my, no. They stay for days, even weeks sometimes. Have a little drink? No, thank you. <laughs> I'd like to waste it, you know. <laughs> Don't you get thinking there's anything wrong? I have connections with private detectives and lawyers. Sometimes it's witnesses they have to keep undercover. Sometimes it's clients who want to avoid process service. Sometimes it's a gentleman who's behind in his alimony. They're all perfectly nice people. Good afternoon, sir. Mr. Brown? Yes? I'm Don Gale, Mr. Silver's friend. You knew him well, didn't you? Indeed, yes. I was perhaps his closest friend. Well, that's what he led me to believe. And he told me that if anything should ever happen to him before I was able to locate a Laura, that I was to get in touch with you, that you'd help me in any way that you can. Naturally. You see, I knew a Laura, too. Well, then you want to see a Laura get what's rightfully hers, and you want to see his murderers brought to justice. Of course. You see, the police seem to be absolutely at a loss. In fact, I don't think anything will ever be done if it's left to them. I know who the murderers are. Uh, could we talk privately in your office? Oh, certainly, Mr. Gale. Right this way. Hello, Charlie. Her name is Frida Hansen. She didn't leave her apartment all day, and the manager came up to see if she was all right. He found her body in a closet. She was strangled with a piece of strong cord. Couch. Well, I'm the manager. When he found her in the closet, he untied this rope from around her throat and carried her in here to revive her. I figured he was about six hours too late. The medical examiner will tell us when she died. Where's the manager now? One downstairs. Go get him. Mr. Gale doesn't want you to leave the house. You mean I'm a prisoner? Don't be absurd. You wanted to come here, didn't you? Aren't you going to answer the door? No. Nope. We're not proceeding tonight. But it might be Mr. Gale. Oh, no. He won't be here until after midnight. Well, I don't know when he'll be here, but if you don't answer the door, I will. Very well. But I know it's not Mr. Gale. August 18th, 1924, General Hospital, parents of Mr. and Mrs. You get the idea? That's the kind of information you'd pass out to anyone going out to do a little job of impersonation. Here's the manager now. Send him in. I'm James Summers, gentlemen. I hope I didn't do wrong in moving the body. But Miss Gordon from next door was with me. We thought Miss Hanson might be still alive. That was a natural thing to do. Where was Frida Hanson employed? Oh, I don't know. Uh, she was a photographic model, I've heard. I guess Miss Gordon would know more about her than anybody. Will you ask Miss Gordon to see us in the lobby in a few minutes? I'd be glad to. Henry? Yes, sir? Go over to my office and get a photograph of Don Gale. You'll find a couple on my desk. Yes, sir. I 
want to see Mr. Taggart or Mr. Burns. I'm a Laura Lund. Did you just leave Don Gale, Miss Lund? No, I didn't. Henry. Yes, sir. This is Miss Lund. This officer will take you to them. They'll want to see you right away. Thank you. This way, miss. You see the man I just described come in here? Yes, he walked right on past the desk without announcing himself. Mr. Summers saw him, too. How long before he came down again? Well, about 20 minutes. Miss Lund came to headquarters looking for you. Mr. Taggart, I... One moment, Miss Lund. Yes, that's him. Now, look carefully and take your time. Your identification will hang that man. So what? He killed Frida, didn't he? And so Gail is charged with the cowardly murder of a woman. The police have a strong motive. They have proof of his opportunity. They have incontrovertible evidence that he was in Frida's apartment at the time she was killed. In fact, they have everything, except Don Gale. just drunk. I've been looking everywhere for you. I hardly expected to find you in a bar. Why not? They found Frida's body. I said they found Frida's body. What are you talking about? The police know that you were at her place, and they're looking for you. I came to warn you that's all I can do for you. It's more than I should. Before you go, tell me, am I supposed to have murdered Frida? Please, Don, don't touch me. Don't even talk to me. People are watching this. You can set your little mind at rest. I disliked Frida, but not enough to kill her. They have proof that you were her apartment at the time she was murdered. If you didn't kill her, who did? I don't know. Someone came to the door, but I didn't see who it was. Good night, Jimmy. Come back soon. Don. Don. You gonna give yourself up? Not right away. You won't last five minutes on the street. Every police car in town is looking for you. And I'll be looking for every police car in town. That'll make us even. Why don't you go to them and tell them everything you know? That's what any innocent man would do. Yeah, well, I'm not any innocent man. Have a look around outside. What are you going to do? I'm going to Stillwell's, and I'm going to get a couple of Jenny Lind records that are worth $200,000. The man who killed Frida knows about them, too. I hope to meet him there. And then you're going to give Laura Lund the records and hand the murderer over to the police. Is that it? That's the plot. I don't believe it. If that were true, you'd go to the police right now. Well, have it your way. I'm going to get those records and head for the border. If I thought you really meant that, I'd go straight to headquarters and tell Taggart and Burns. Do what you like.
Gail's secretary. She's going back to tell him the coast is clear. has been murdered. And if the police catch you here, they'll pin this one on you, too. I can't read the rest of it, but I can read Jenny Lind. And I said it was all a pipe dream. We better get out of here. Come on. You kind of put those records on the floor, Mr. Summers. I guess it's time for us all to be reasonable. We'll declare you in, Mr. Gale. I'm not interested. Pontus was one of your partners, and Frida the other. Frida can thank you for what she got. You were going to turn her over to the police. I'm going to turn you over. Your friend here and the records. You were kidding. You wouldn't throw a fortune like this away. Oh, but I would. Somebody's going to hang for Frida and Stilwell. If it isn't you, I'm very much afraid it might be me. Now, this is Don Gale. Get in touch with Taggart and Burns and tell him I'm at Brown's Brass Shop. I've got Frida Hansen's murderer and the Jenny Lind records that cause all the trouble.
Too bad. One of the bullets went right through the box before it hit him. And so, after long years of balancing precariously on the borderline of the law, Don Gale was trying at the end to do the right thing. But he made one fatal mistake. Thinking that one of the killers had come back to attack him, he fired blindly. Taggart and Burns will never know that Gale's shots were not meant for them. <laughs>